we don't call this uh, just a fake anymore. It's a supply chain problem. And I've been looking at supply chain problems now for the last two years in some depth. And what really struck me about supply chain problems was that everybody has a different view of what it means and what the real problem is. It's not just about uh, counterfeits. It's not just about um, fakes. It's, it, there's a whole story around both the solutions and the problem. And it's really interesting to get the viewpoint of what supply chain issues in software, and particularly industrial control system software is, from different, uh, from the vendor, from the uh, customer, from the suppliers, from the uh, researchers. Everybody has a different view. So what we wanted to do today was get the viewpoint of a whole bunch of different people who are experts in this field. And as you know, we've got Brian Owen representing the vendor. We've got Billy Rios representing the bad guy. We've got uh, Jacob Ketel here representing the asset owner. And we've got, um, let's see, who have I missed there? Oh, Jonathan Butts, and he's going to be representing the researcher. So we're going to have them come out and talk about their views of what supply chain management and supply chain security means for the industrial control system security uh, field, and particularly what we can do as a community, because it's not just something a vendor can solve or an asset owner, it has to be a community. So without saying much more, we're going to move forward. I'm going to pass the clicker to these guys, and they can discuss all the issues that they see and all the solutions as well. So I'll pass it off here to Master Billy. Arr. <laughs> As soon as I get it. <laughs> Your grubby little shark hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I think, hey, Eric. Oh, we need a mic. <laughs> hey, Eric. <clears throat> shark. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of want to walk through um, a quick example of how firmware is actually exploited. Uh, I'm going to walk you through an example of something that we had saw earlier, essentially where we were able to obtain some firmware from a, a, a pretty well-known consumer device manufacturer, reverse engineer, how that firmware worked, uh, and then be able to actually uh, leverage that for, for further things, right? So in this case, what we're looking at is actually looking at the firmware update routine itself, which actually tells us where the vendor is storing the firmware on their cloud infrastructure. Uh, and then once we have that, we can actually download that, do some reverse engineering, and figure out whether or not there's any security protection mechanisms for the firmware update process itself. And so this is important because a lot of folks think, hey, you know, so what? It's some random device or whatever. But the particular exploit that we had uh, actually allowed us to exploit the device even though the device was not on the internet or internet facing. So we're actually able to leverage uh, the position of someone inside of an, a protected enclave or an internal network. If they were to reach out to a compromised website like in a watering hole attack, we could actually initiate a firmware update in a device. And so, uh, and maybe we weren't so concerned about the device itself, but really what we were concerned about is like the access that, that, that this device would give us inside of the protective enclave. So even if you don't have a device that's facing the internet or anything like that, uh, this is still a pretty big concern because it could give us a foothold into a protective enclave or, or into an internal network, right? So, uh, and then that's what this, these sets of slides here show. And then the next thing I want to touch on is that once you start to understand how these firmwares are, are served to devices or individuals or anything like that, we can actually start to take a look at some of that. Like, for example, uh, this is uh, a location for firmware that we found inside of a, a, a firmware that we had downloaded. Uh, and it tells us where their debugging server is. And we know it's their debugging server because if you actually go to that server where this firmware is being served, there's actually debugging files on there from various developers and things like that. And inside one of those files, inside one of those development files, was a key, right? And so now not only do we have the ability to you know, modify firmware and serve a, a, a tampered firmware to a device, now we can actually sign that firmware as if we were uh, a different company or, or sign that firmware so that the device actually respected and, and believed that it was an authentic firmware, right? So uh, some of the folks on the stage are going to be talking about some of these scenarios a little bit in the future, but I wanted to show you uh, some of the actual research that we had done in the couple, last couple of years. Yeah, and I think uh, from a discussion standpoint, really we want to drive, kind of start with the asset owner, some of the implications of that from the standpoint of when we talk about um, how do you protect against that, what do you look at, you know, where, what are the implications of those kind of the threats that the community in general is not looking at from that perspective at this point. So. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of challenges, right? Uh, and it really um, starts with how big you are 
and how many devices that you have. Um, then you have to start looking at um, uh, how popular are your devices, right? Um, we expect the larger vendors to do pretty well, right, in managing their infrastructure and managing their software because they kind of have to to succeed at the scale that they're at. Um, so it makes discovery pretty easy, right, when it comes to managing, starting to manage the software and the, the supply chain beginning to end for the devices that you have. Um, but the challenge for them is that uh, implementation becomes a lot harder because you have way more devices uh, and there's, there's way more of a human cost to implementing um, software upgrades and managing your supply chain, right? Um, conversely, uh, when you have vendors that are smaller, um, fewer devices, discovery is generally very hard, but implementation is going to be a lot easier because you have fewer devices. Uh, it's less of a hurdle, right? So there's, there's trade-offs all along the chain. And so Brian, kind of, you know, from the vendor perspective, you know, we, digital signatures, things of that nature, obviously some of our core uh, security principles, but what are the challenges you face on the update side of it? Because that's a huge challenge I can imagine that like OSI soft and, you know, from your perspective, just from a vendor perspective in general. So firmware is a really interesting one to start with though, and I'd be interested, to, any of you guys chime in, but I think most of the audience would agree that um, that's one of those times in servicing software where you almost hold your breath because you know when that software is going on, there's some, some chance. I mean, a lot of times you even say, well, don't turn this device off right now because, man, while that's happening, um, you, you're exposed and that device might not come back. So uh, I think there is a huge, call it inertia or friction, to actually updating firmware and servicing it. Yeah. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, I'm generally hesitant to just say, hey, there's, you know, kind of one carte blanche solution that you would tell multiple device vendors to do. Uh, but I think firmware signing is one of those things that it's a general recommendation that you can provide to a lot of different manufacturers, regardless even even what industry they're working in, right? So um, I understand that there are some challenges in up updating embedded devices. Um, we've looked at industries where there's critical infrastructure that's running that absolutely can't go down, and doing a software update always brings in some amount of risk. Uh, and then, you know, we've also worked in industries where there's implanted devices that are literally inside someone's body, where if something goes wrong with a software update, now, then it's going to require a medical procedure to take it out. But uh, at the end of the day, only the vendor software should be on those devices, right? And one of the ways to kind of make sure that that's the case is to do code signing, right? So uh, I, I think it's something that every manufacturer should think of, regardless of what industry they're in. And then, of course, there's an operational piece to that that is kind of a separate discussion, but the ability to code sign, the ability to verify code sign signatures, I think is pretty important in every industry. Yeah, so exactly. Having, uh, just to jump onto that one, having the confidence that you have the, the right bits is a super yeah. important part of it, but on the, something to learn maybe in our sector from the medical uh, areas is like to up, update those medical devices, it was actually a go in to the hospital kind of procedure right. to update yeah. firmware on some of those yeah. devices. Uh, and. Uh, Reading, I would encourage anyone to read what that medical instruction was from the manufacturer to, to the doctors. There were certain conditions that they said, hey, if the patient's in this kind of situation, this update procedure is not recommended. And I thought it was really a well done a set of advice to go along with the firmware update. Yeah, and I think that's in, important too when we talk about that uh, from a standpoint um, of involving that operator, in this case the operator we'll call the physician, but uh, involving the operator to understanding from a vendor, so the asset owner and the vendor to where there's that dialogue at least, so that they understand the risk, so they can make those risk-based decisions on, um, do I need, is it more important for me to have an uptime? Are there compensating controls I can uh, look at from that standpoint, things of those nature? Yeah, so. I, I think Billy made a really good point about guaranteeing that it's only the vendor software on the device. Um, because if, if I have 5,000 of your devices um, and I have to add a significant amount of time to verify that it's the vendor software on, on the devices to go along with that 5,000 times, maybe I'm doubling or tripling the amount of effort that I have to do to deploy the, that software and manage it and ensure that it succeeds. So the more work that can be done up front um, and make it usable, and more guaranteed, the less work that I have to do on the back end to implement it. Uh, and then the risk is around scheduling uh, and ensuring that I just go through my processes correctly, not crossing my fingers and also doing that, right? Right, yeah. 
I, I would actually like to add one, one last thing. Um, so, you know, just through the course of the work that we do, we like to stay on the very cutting edge. And to be uh, completely honest with you, there are certain industries that are very much moving ahead with code signing as an industry, right? So that's a good thing. Uh, and when you look at code signing, kind of generally speaking, it seems like it's a pretty simple concept. But uh, what we're starting to see is that, you know, because certain industries are heavily relying on code signing, like automotive, for example, the Tesla, the Tesla firmware is signed, right? Obviously, mobile phones, uh, firmware operating system components are signed. Uh, even on regular operating systems, if you want to install a device driver, that device driver now has to be signed, right? And so uh, what we're starting to see is on the high end spectrum of the offensive world, getting access to code signing keys is actually a pretty important thing. And so we've already seen that in Stuxnet. We've seen that in malware, uh, especially state-sponsored malware that's been deployed over the last year. And so code signing keys are pretty important. And so if you don't have the infrastructure to protect your keys, uh, maybe you should try to seek out someone who has that type of infrastructure, right? So the code signing itself and the concepts around code signing are pretty simple. Uh, and it seems like it's a very simple problem to try to solve. But operationally, if you lose your signing key and your signing key is trusted by Microsoft, um, that actually creates a, an issue for the entire ecosystem, right? So, so be careful on how you do this. Uh, if you feel like you're in over your head, uh, maybe you should seek help from someone to try to figure this out. All right, so I'll move along here a little bit. And this is, uh, I know Eric kind of had, had a lead in about, this is kind of back to what you're talking about. How do we, validating the certificate signing, is it pinned back properly? So um, it, within the, even within a browser system, uh, is it uh, the, it might be a legitimate signed cert, but is it pinned correctly? Chain, yeah. So that the chain is, uh, is legitimate. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be solved through that. Um, and so kind of moving on to our next kind of topic from a perspective is, is looking at specifically counterfeit firmware. So we talked a little bit about tearing apart and so some of the key things we find when we do analysis on firmware. Uh, from a counterfeit perspective, uh, really we've already seen this rolled out. And this is back to kind of the skit up front is, hey, can you, can you trust that supply chain? And so where do you get that? Uh, firmware software from, is it valid and is it legitimate? And so we've seen this in the past already. These are a couple older examples, but the Dragonfly is probably the most well-known, right? So they actually compromise vendor websites uh, and then replace the firmware software updates with uh, malicious packages so that when the end user would download it, they were downloading uh, malicious software. What this does is this goes directly into your system, bypassing any external controls you have. You have firewalls, you have um, IDS, any of those aspects going, you actually bypass that because the technician will download this and then just take it to the end system and install it. So that's a little, that's concerning uh, for sure because that lowers the bar of entry from the attacker perspective. At this point, they only have to compromise that website or a disk or some other means of how you, mechanism of how you get that. Uh, the same point is uh, the, the Rockwell stuff, they got hit um, somebody just packaged the ransomware and called it a Rockwell update and sent it out there. And so did people install it on updates? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but this chance is it's easy to just target from that manner to put uh, malicious software out there and call it something else. And so uh, when we get into this, uh, the requirements, you don't even need the device. I just need a, a copy of the firmware. And the, most of the part, they're not digitally signed. They don't have uh, signatures. So really all we're looking for is what's, what's the CRC? So we have to re reverse how it validates that it's legitimate before it goes on the system. Once we find that, then we can just reverse it. And in this part, um, we can do some go through debugging interfaces, uh, things of that nature, just to pull it off. Um, once we do the analysis and we find out what that validation method is, the CRC, we can reverse that. And typically, we'll just hook in somewhere um, with our own payload. So that, in this case, we can. there's a flash override where it'll just brick the whole system, and you'll never be able to boot to it again. So these are some of the payloads. And the problem is you can set these timers on this until it doesn't execute till you want. So it might not happen for months or weeks or things of that nature. So then you just repackage and distribute it. So uh, again, I think from a vendor perspective, maybe, Brian, we'll start with you on some of the discussions around just the counterfeit aspect of dealing with that, and uh, even IP loss, I guess, as a vendor is another. Well, it's, it's just an absolute nightmare to um, go through these scenarios that um, have affected, whether it's Havex or whatever, where people are downloading software that they think is, is legitimate and it's not. And uh, the protections maybe um, are only human in nature, whether they, um, they, they basically just blindly trust, right? And that's, that's really, um, really the problem. So. Uh, Reputation damage is actually one of the biggest things that we find that company executives worry about. When this has happened to companies, it's, it's, 
it's horrid. Like it's, oh gosh, here is someone that's abused the trust in, in our brand and uh, we wouldn't ever want to have that happen and it ties back to the signing discussion we had before this. Um, but there would be also be the recovery uh, in, in terms of this and uh, I haven't experienced that kind of case study where it's actually had to um, try and revoke something that's been downloaded from our site or something like that. But um, we've heard stories of um, like flame and those kind of things where really even the best in the business were affected by this kind of problem yeah. and it, it's very difficult to recover from. Yeah, one of the things that Jonathan uh, walked through was the reverse engineering of firmware. And um, I know kind of it seems very abstract, but it's a pretty important thing in ICS, um, and I'll tell you why. Um, when we're looking at regular software, maybe we're just looking to get something like a shell back to one of our command and control servers and uh, be able to get access to a certain environment. But when we're looking at ICS systems, whether it's traditional ICS or SCADA, healthcare, medical, or transportation, uh, what we're really looking for is effects. And what I mean by effects is we want to make the device do something it's probably not supposed to do. And, and a lot of times for that, uh, those scenarios, we don't need a command and control. And so a lot of the kind of traditional uh, you know, defenses that you have from network monitoring or threat intelligence that's going to tell you where uh, command and control servers are on the internet, that's not going to work in ICS because we don't need to command and control it. We just want a specific effect or we want to deny a, a specific effect at a specific time, right? And so that's the reverse engineering of the binaries that we're looking at. We're looking at your software safety mechanisms. We're looking at how a device actually works uh, in, a, in an environment that we're interested in, right? So, uh, and so the game changes a little bit when we're talking about uh, systems that can have some kind of physical consequence. Um, and most times we're not looking to get some kind of reverse shell back out to our own infrastructure. In most, in most cases, we're just trying to put our payload on the device and make the payload execute something that we want to execute at a time we want to execute. So uh, being able to do some inspection on your own firmware that you're getting from places or understand how the, those firmware pieces work, it's pretty important. And being able to do forensics uh, on devices is pretty important as well. I'll say, too, kind of from a research perspective, uh, one of the things, it, it's not a protection mechanism, but one of the challenges as a researcher in the ICS SCADA space is it's an expensive entry point, right? So you can order some devices and stuff at a certain level, but yeah. you can't go build an oil and gas pipeline on yourself to do, you know, by yourself to, to research that. That's a challenge. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Billy's got one in his backyard that he doesn't know. Um, but one of the interesting aspects about this is we just go pull the firmware down. And most of the times it's freely accessible by either downloading directly or you just sign up for a user account. And once you're signed up for the account, you can download the firmware. I don't need to go build anything. I just get that firmware aspect, figure out what effect I want to make, mo modify the firmware and the means that to achieve the effect we want to, and then just push it out to the community would be the, yeah. the attack vector I, on that. I, I've, I've paid people for firmware. Mm -hmm. So I've definitely paid people for firmware to get firmware that I couldn't normally get access to. Uh, I've, pa I've paid people for software as well. Um, you know, just you just tell them what kind of. Usually, it's like an integrator, an individual, not the actual integrator selling you the software, but some individual, you know, inside of an integrator, and you just tell them, hey, I'm interested in getting this, you know, software or this firmware. Can you get it for me? And they manage to get it somehow, right? So, uh, you'd be surprised as to what you can get uh, if if you really put your mind to it. So, how many devices are you seeing um, where? I think this is in one of the IoT good practice guides. Maybe it's NCSC that talks about a device should be able to hold on to its own previous load and then like if a new firmware come down you always have a way to get back and, and and then from Jacob's perspective is that a device that you would like to have in your your facilities right yeah I mean I, I it's actually getting more common uh, I don't think it's done for security reasons I think it's done really more for reliability reasons um, when a firmware update occurs and actually some kind of failure happens during the update to have the ability to roll back to like a known good firmware on the system itself. Uh, I've definitely seen that. That means that your device is storing two copies of firmware uh, at any given moment. And so if you're doing forensics or anything like that, you want to ensure that that quote unquote known good copy that's being stored usually in an EEPROM uh, is, is not been tampered as well. So, but it's, it's becoming more and more common and, and most like safety critical environments, you'll, you'll probably see something like that. But uh, I, I don't think they implement that for security reasons, even though it has some security benefit, uh, really more for reliability reasons. So. Yeah, that, that's really important. Um, you know, getting the software is an important piece, right? Um, but 
having the usability be something that, well, I hesitate to call it enjoyable because it's always stressful and risky to do those updates. Um, but, but not having to worry about that piece makes doing the actual operations much more easy. Um, and it gives you the energy to focus on planning, recovery, managing the risk, managing the schedule, um, and just trying to climb that mountain, right? Uh, and scaling a big environment and updating a big environment, right? Because <clears throat> the regulations are generally only increasing and applying to new environments. Um, and uh, most organizations of a significant size have built the structure internally um, and the processes to manage those things. But um, the scale is still hard uh, for some of those companies, right? Um, it's still a very big challenge when you go into those risky environments where uh, you, you might operate the IT equipment or the technology, uh, but someone else is going to tell you when you can actually do the work, right? And you might not get a window for a month to be able to do something, or it might be longer in some cases, right? Uh, so you really, uh, the less things you have to worry about and the more user-friendly the process is, the better it's going to go and the less people are going to worry about, well, should I really do this now or, or can I afford to wait, right? And it'll be less of a concern. So um, I think this is back to kind of Brian hit on a little bit is understanding the, the trustworthiness of it. And that's kind of, you know, as we lay out the problems, uh, the first one is like, hey, how do, you, how do you validate legitimacy, digital signing, or using some means of attestation? Uh, the, the trustworthiness is, I think, that how do you validate the uh, aspect? I will say like MD5 sums or hashes alone are not sufficient. Uh, because most of those are just published right on the website next to the firmware. So if I get access to the website, I'm going to modify the firmware and I'll just change the MD5 hash to look good too. Uh, so a means of actually doing that attestation that it really did legitimately come from the vendor, I think, is kind of uh, the aspect of that. Um, and here's just an example of a way you can do some of that score rating on that perspective. But um, Brian here, I know this is kind of your part, I think, right? Yeah, sure. So. Mystery components is uh, probably means something a little bit different to everyone. And I'd like to highlight a few of the things that are very current um, that kind of highlight these mystery components a little bit. So I picked something here from uh, just, just December. Uh, some of you might have heard of the uh, Cyber ITL project. It's really focused at the consumer level. I wish we had a Cyber ITL for the industrial world. Maybe someone's working on that. But um, <laughs> the, the idea is that here's a whole bunch of uh, home routers that have, yeah, they got mystery components like crazy in there. Um, and the question I put out to all of you is, what makes us think that industrial equipment's any better? What, what is there that attests to the, to the idea that there's, um, that the software that's in there is what we think it is? And it's not, uh, not full of known, known poor components. Uh, as, as in the case of these routers. Um, I encourage anyone that hasn't uh, got familiarity with Cyber ITL and the work.mudge uh, the Zatcos have been doing uh, to, to put that on your must read list. I, I mean, even things like uh, uh, what kind of software is in your car, these guys are writing about it. Uh, and it's quite interesting what, what kind of software comes with modern cars these days. Um, the other group I'd like to call out uh, is uh, uh, Alan Friedman's uh, work out of Department of Commerce. He's got this large uh, group going on uh, for so transparency in software. And uh, uh, software bill of materials is a concept that's very uh, emerging out of that group. And there's a lot of checks and balances in there. Uh, Rob Graham that uh, you saw in the interview yesterday sits on there as one of the contrarians helping bring balance to the force there. Cade Mazuris, also another, another one. But on, on the pro side, Art Mannion, you'll, he's here at S4. You can talk to him. He's, he's contributed a lot to this group, as well as um, Josh Corman, a, a S4 alumni uh, as well, really working to shape what does a software bill of materials look like for things like medical instruments, for industrial control systems, really something that be applied across the entire software ch supply chain. Uh, so some of these slides actually came from Art, so thank you, Art. I didn't warn you in advance. Um, but um, some of the tough questions that have to be dug into with respect to uh, software bill of materials is, what are we really talking about? How granular do you go? 
Uh, are we talking of, uh, you know, at, at uh, the configuration level? Does it go all the way down to the silicon? Uh, there are some really uh, tough questions of uh, what does a software bill of materials uh, really mean? And what's, uh, what seems to be emerging is, well, let's be sure that what we do is provide some kind of actionable information. So probably getting too granular is, isn't, uh, isn't the direction that they'll initially go. Um, so ask Art about the, that some more. And then what really makes this happen, um, a lot of the industry thinkers, and I know um, our panelists have been involved with some of these regulatory circles, is, is a push from standards bodies, a push from uh, regulatory bodies to say, hey, you really have to do this. And uh, uh, to this audience, uh, the electric sector is clearly working hard on supply chain. The medical sector working very hard on it, but we weren't the first. The, the finance sector has been doing it for years, and uh, so we know this is doable. Uh, can we make it scalable across these wide, uh, wide uh, ecosystems now? So um, those are good conversations to have, and that's what I'm hoping we'll talk about uh, in, in this this part of the yeah. discussion. And so, Brian, I want to jump in kind of a little bit to I guess, stir the pot. But uh, from one perspective, I say when, when Billy and I, if we go from a research perspective, when we look at firmware, there's so many, well, generally speaking, there's a lot of outdated third-party libraries and software. And so when we look at the software firmware and we do analysis on it, I, I think the vendor is not even aware that they're using outdated third-party libraries. And so when you talk about the bill of materials and stuff is, First, I'll throw it out to you as a vendor. How do you track the fact that you're using third-party code, um, and how do you make sure that stays updated when an update comes out for that? Then the second part, I'll throw over to Jacob and say, you know, as a, do you just rely strictly on the vendor, or what other choice do you have than to rely on the vendor to say, the, the underneath the covers, this is good. Yeah, if a software update comes out for the overarching thing, but what about the components underneath? So that's kind of the grenade toss there. Hey, this is, uh, you know, re reformed, uh, uh, you know, supplier in terms of not realizing everything that, that was in our kit, right? We had out-of-date components being shipped. Um, and uh, when this first really struck me hard, um, uh, it, I'll tell the story. It was really back in 2012 and on the common controls vulnerabilities. Some of you heard me present at S4 on that, but the, the trick was we knew that these components were in there, but they were, we were repackaging um, Microsoft's common controls. Everyone in the OPC era and the ActiveX COM era used these controls, widely used all over uh, ICS. But we were under the impression that Windows updates were servicing them. And uh, the big surprise was, no. Windows update wasn't servicing them. And when you read the fine print, in these things is they're only serviced if they were installed by a Microsoft product. So some percentage of our customers were getting the updates, the other percentage weren't because they had maybe really locked down the system so that it was only uh, the ICS related components. And uh, that, was a, that was a big eye opener for us. Um, but but I'll, let's, so, let's hear yeah, from Jacob's yeah, well, side. I've got more stories. Process <laughs> now? Is there a formal process or is that? you know, do vendors not really, are they not that there yet? Generally? So, so on the, the, the other big eye opener for everyone was uh, the open SSL Heartbleed stuff. You know, the, I think the first malware that had a logo maybe. Um, okay. And uh, Mike Amadia. <laughs> yeah, where's Mike? <laughs> but the, uh, the thought there was, is, okay, we all, all vendors did the fire drill to see, well, where is open SSL? And we had tracked third-party components in spreadsheets at that time. And uh, what we discovered in that fire drill was um, we were, our spreadsheets were accurate for the first order dependency, like you know, going from first party to second party code, but to get into the third and fourth party dependencies, we didn't. We had to actually scan our uh, source code repos looking for uh, third-party products that included OpenSSL to find, ooh, we got a few more that we didn't didn't know about, so we went on the search for uh, for a tool. 
we work with many of the other um, automation companies uh, and <coughs> compared notes with them. Have you guys found tools that works for this? We all had the same problem and uh, it really wasn't, uh, we didn't decide on a tool until um, till last year to help us out. So that problem is real and it probably still exists for a lot of suppliers that haven't been able to roll out the state-of-the-art tools. Yeah, uh, one, one example that I can share is, um, could be summarized as just just being able to read the state and read the internals and read about what's included goes a long way, right? Because um, you know when there's problems in indus any industry, vendors get creative to try and solve them, right? They're trying to give the customers value and they're trying to make money and be profitable. So they're looking for ways to combine things um, to give the customer more of what they want while spending less, make it easier to manage. So people get creative, things get put together, um, things get leveraged, right? You wouldn't, uh, if you could uh, white label or outsource something from another vendor and include it in your product and save development time and money and that you can turn around and deliver value to a customer, you're probably going to do it as a, as a vendor, right? It's a solid, reliable move. Um, the downside is if you don't then turn around and ensure that all of that information is exposed and discoverable. It makes it hard to, to quantify what the risk is and what a problem is, right? Yeah. If a regulator comes to you and asks you a question about a very specific software vendor, and they say, tell us everywhere that you have this software, you know, it, it's in your best interest to be diligent and truthful to the regulator, right? And try to answer. But if you don't have the means of discovering it, um, or there's a disconnect between documentation and what's in the field, and if it's a complicated case, it, you have to really run it down to be able to get the true answers, right? And that, that causes a big issue. And even though it's not fair to say that that happens all the time, when it happens once, it becomes the norm, right? And now everybody's going to think, wow, the last time we had to do this, it was a total pain. Uh, it took us forever. It was hard to discover the full extent I hope I don't have to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm going to cross my fingers and try to buffer it somehow, right? And put a process in place or, or something, right? It, it's just a huge pain point is that discovery. Uh, so you can make the decision and try to do the right thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I actually love software bill of materials just as a concept. Um, and I think uh, the next uh, pre-market guidance from the FDA will have some language in there about uh, software bill of materials. But there is a couple, there's a couple gotchas and there's a couple danger points with software bill of materials, right? So, um, you know, a couple years ago, me and some colleagues kind of embarked on a project to just do essentially identification of third party libraries and devices. And, uh, you know, we would produce these reports with like 4,000 known vulnerabilities and pacemaker programmers and 3,000 known vulnerabilities and in infusion pumps and things like that. And then, you know, someone would ask us after we deliver the, port, the report, like, hey, what does this mean? And we would be like, I don't know, right? So does this, does this have any patient safety implications? Does it have any operational implications? Can these things be exploited remotely? You know? And so like, I don't know. Uh, tracking down the uh, attack paths for 4,000 vulnerabilities on a pacemaker programmer takes a lot of time, right? If you, did, if you track down one a day, it would take you like a decade, right? So, uh, so we definitely don't want to substitute that for our risk management processes, right? Uh, but however, I, I think I agree with the the panelists here, like just having that information is pretty important, right? Uh, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be the sole calculating factor of our risk management program, but uh, it could definitely influence it, right? So, uh, so we have to be a little careful there. Just to piggyback on to that carefulness is there's also a tendency in uh, this space to for things to get sensationalized, and uh, uh, the the data uh, and there is hard data from uh, uh, like uh, Vericode and other code scanning uh, folks that say that known vulnerabilities, uh, libraries with known vulnerabilities, it's really only about 30% of the time that those vulnerabilities are actually, that there's a pathway, that they're actually exposed. So it's a cool thing that this effort for supply chain software bill materials is going on to help run down that 30%, but let's, let's also be real. It's not necessarily the yeah. biggest problem. We shouldn't go off and uh, print big headlines because some product is using a vulnerable library, that doesn't mean that it's exploitable. Yeah. So I guess um, one last question to Billy on this is, 
when you're doing the analysis, because again, what we're talking about here is a little bit different space than what we see. You see a lot of movement right now in, in our uh, area in the ICS security is a lot of uh, active passive monitoring, watching uh, stuff go over the wire. Uh, there's a lot of interest in that, and rightfully so, looking at those aspects. It's a little bit different because this is a direct, this is on your update process, and not only um, are there vulnerabilities in the firmware software, but can I trust the firmware software going on it? So kind of to you, Billy, is like in this space, you know, what do you see as when you're out there researching this? Like what are some of the, the, the probably biggest thing you see when you're looking at firmware and, and software as far as risk, concerns, vulnerabilities. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you kind of nailed it, right? So really, when we look at firmware, especially if we're going to try to exploit some device at the firmware level, uh, really it comes down to two things. One, what does their update mechanism look like? And really, that really comes down to, are they validating the authenticity or the provenance of the firmware that they're about to install? Does the device do that? And number two, what types of vulnerabilities are within the firmware itself? And those are actually two different problem sets, right? So, uh, and I can tell you this, you know, if we do do a scan on your firmware, we find 4,000 known vulnerabilities. Uh, I'm not saying that you know, uh, all of them are exploitable remotely, but it kind of does say something towards your engineering, right? So we can look at that and say, we're going to find something here, right? Uh, and so it, it, even though every single one of those vulnerabilities may not lead to a safety issue um, or some kind of physical effect, it does, gives us, it does give us some promise as to what we're going to be looking for, right? So, um, but with that said, I think it kind of comes down to the two problem sets verifying your firmware, because if you don't, we're just going to be able to put whatever we want onto the device. And if you do verify the firmware, then we probably shift to this other problem set of, hey, they are verifying the authenticity or the integrity or the provenance of the software that they're about to install on the device. Therefore, we need to find a vulnerability in the firmware in order to get onto the device. And so um, it's definitely kind of a, 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 a branch in our logic when we're looking at exploiting devices, for sure. Yeah, I think this handoff between um, uh, the vendors and uh, the asset owners is a place where you know the football gets fumbled. It gets dropped on the ball. It's the, there isn't always time uh, to get or the tools that make it easy to validate that you're actually getting the right software or or what's in the software is good. And uh, I really applaud you know this initiative to work on supply chain and bring those tools uh, to cover that gap between, uh, between the asset owners and the vendors and uh, make it easier to check that everything is the way it should be. Yeah, I want to add mm -hmm. something to that. Um, I've only really seen two mechanisms that have effectively uh, caused people to upgrade their software. Um, number one is just public pressure. Like, uh, I dare anyone in here to be a CSO of a major Fortune 1000 and run a vulnerable version of JBoss on one of your apps, right? So I dare you to do that. Um, the amount of public scrutiny and the amount of public you know, uh, whippings you will get for that is going to be immense, right? So folks are definitely interested in that. In fact, uh, we've been approached by folks that are like, I just want to know whether or not my JBoss is good, right? So, but number two, there's actually been cybersecurity recalls. Right? And for those of you that don't know, the way that a cybersecurity recall works is it's not like they come and take the device from you and say you can never use this ever again. The way a cybersecurity recall works is actually they don't allow you to use a specific version uh, on the device. And so we've seen three of these already. We've seen one in automotive. We've seen two in healthcare. Right? And it's not like they went to hospitals and ripped devices out. Basically, the regulator came and said, we will not allow anyone in the United States to run this specific version of this software on those devices. Right, and so whether that's the right answer for ICS or not, I don't know, right? But uh, it is a way to make sure that everyone is covered, right? And those are kind of the two, I think, most effective ways of, of getting people to update their code other than you know, trying to convince them through whatever uh, that it's the right thing to do, right? And so I guess kind of close up here a little bit. We're short on time. Uh, maybe um, can you flip Brian to the last slide that we'll give a uh, talk about. Just real briefly, one of the projects, which is uh, Dulles, you saw Eric Byers in the shark outfit. Hopefully everybody got their pictures out on that, but uh, uh, you can go all the way to the end on the slides. But uh, this is actually uh, a project he's working with and we're supporting him. Uh, it was funded through DHS to look at some of these issues. 
Uh, so specifically from a vendor perspective through the asset owner, uh, how do you validate that it is legitimate software firmware? Uh, how do I know what uh, components are inside are vulnerable and can I trace that back? Uh, so this is kind of like the Matt, uh, the aspect from the end is uh, it's a DHS project right now. We're looking for just collaborative partners. Um, right. That comes Eric to, to wrap it up in the in the shark outfit. So uh, I'll, I'll, the right shark. He was the Katy Perry right shark. So. Yeah, I couldn't get any more work with Katy Perry after the Super Bowl. But um, we really want to invite. This is a community problem that we see. Um, so we really want to invite everybody, vendors and users, researchers, uh, the developers of software tools to really work with us and join us. Um, and this is, as we see it, is uh, only going to get solved if we create a community. Um, we started off with using Billy's white scope tools and sort of evolved along. You've seen a few screenshots of what the platform can do, but really it's a platform to allow uh, the community to share. So if you're a vendor, you can, uh, we will show you how you can contribute the hashes of your files and the, and the fingerprints of your files if you're an end user. Well, actually, if you're an end user, you want to go to the next slide for me. Um, if you're an end user right now, oh, hey, nope, I guess it died. Oh, well. Uh, so if you're an end user, um, right now we're letting people onto the beta system at no charge. Um, you can play with it. And in fact, we've got a little contest going um, and you can win this suit. Um, <laughs> so, or not. <laughs> or not, it's up to you. Um, and, we're, and just try out the platform, um, play around with it, and, and use it, and then give us feedback. Um, and you can get to the platform by going Adolis uh, slash contest, or come and see me, I'll give you a card. Um, but the whole idea here is really to try and build this as a community um, and make this work for all of ICS. Uh, vendors, asset owners, researchers, um, software developers, and, and try and um, build a solution to our uh, challenges around the supply chain. Okay. Go ahead. Arr. 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 My good man. Yo. -ho. <laughs> that last battle was a little too close for my scurvy blood. Yo. This time we upgrade our firepower but no match for the long nines of those blasted Spaniards. It's time we make port in Tortuga and seek to spread some of our hard-earned gold. Aye, Captain Jacob. Rumor is there are fine new cannons to be had at Master Brian's Cannons and Guns Emporium. He trades in only the best equipment. True that be, for all his landlubbery ways, there be no merchant so trustworthy as Master Brian. It is said no less than Blackbeard and Long John Silver themselves do trade with his establishment. And no finer a supplier there be. Well, his shop is right at the dock. No doubt we'll find cannons aplenty. Arr, heave to and let's make way. Arr. Ahoy, my good chaps. Will you be wanting to see my wares? Cannons I have, guns and cannons. Fuses, powder, everything an enterprise pirate needs to be successful in plying his trade. Though I blush to say, my reputation is well known amongst the Spanish main as a purveyor of the finest goods in the Caribbean. Aye, we've heard you're a shop and we trust your wares. What have you in fast fi firing reliable cannons? We have a little rendezvous planned with an English frigate known to be carrying great crates of silver. We'll no be wanting to introduce ourselves without a little adequate firepower. We need to make a good first impression. Hmm, Billy, let's show the gents the Kaboom 5000. Aye, aye, Master Brian. Are yo ho. This is the Kaboom 5000, the finest cannon for sea battle. As you can see, it is a weapon of mass destruction. It is a wonder. We'll take it forthwith. A fine addition to our arsenal. Now what damage to my purse will this be causing? Now, 
the important thing with the Kaboom 5000 are the add-ons. <laughs> Each component is specially crafted to maximize your pillaging success. For example, the fuse is state-of-the-art. Nor the wind nor the sea spray will put these fuses out. It's available in packs of 30 or 50. Mm, Captain Jacob, methinks we'll be needing the 50 pack. Always more of my gold. <laughs> Check this here. <laughs> we don't have much left. Mm. What else do you have for us, Master Billy? <laughs> Aye, Master Brian, the finest most expensive and explosive powder. <laughs> oh. They are beauties indeed. We'll take all you've got. <laughs> we'll take all the cannonballs. Those cannonballs have been polished by Billy's own hand. <laughs> They're very fine and crafted for precision. Mm. Thank you for those. Now, Billy mate, bring out some powder. These mates will be needing the most good powder. Aye, aye, Master Brian. Yo ho. This is the finest, most expensive and explosive powder that we have. Ooh. You'll be needing the purest, the cleanest for dispatching of the Spanish masts and sails. They are reinforced by blockchain. Mind you, you need the best. <sighs> Captain, look sharp now. I've heard the tell there's been bad powder being passed off as true by scurvy dogs looking to shave a few silvers. Ah, no offense, Master. Shiver me timbers. I'll no hear a bad word about Master Brian. He has my full trust and confidence. Well, it is no reflection on our good friend here, and I mean no offense. The waggling tongues around the dock say that the very merchants themselves have been hoodwinked on occasion. All's well then. Load up the powder, Billy boy, and I'll settle our account here. It was a pleasure doing business with you, Master Brian. Always a pleasure, man. Come now, Jonathan, my good man, before he steals all of our gold. <laughs> Let us dally no further. We have a date with a frigate. But first, I have a powerful thirst. Let us make for the Beast and Brawl Saloon. Arr! Well done, Billy. Arr! Arr! 